Let's talk a bit more about the metric tensor as well as some of its important properties and applications. We'll begin by defining the metric tensor in another way that'll prove useful. In the previous video, we spoke about how the components of the metric tensor serve as modifiers when it comes to evaluating the arc length integral. However, we can use the metric tensor in another way by using the basis vectors instead. Suppose I have a coordinate system in n dimensions with basis vectors given by e1, e2, all the way to e sub n. In general, if I select two basis vectors in this coordinate system, I can write them as ei and ej, where both i and j are indices that run from 1 to n. Now the ij component of the metric tensor corresponding to this coordinate system can be computed just by taking the dot product of the basis vector ei and the basis vector ej. So g sub ij is ei dot ej. It's that simple. From this expression, you can also see why the metric tensor is written using covariant indices i and j, that is, indices that are subscripts at the bottom. That's because the metric tensor is created using the basis vectors, which themselves are covariant. Let me go on the side to explain why these basis vectors are covariant. Recall from a previous video that whether a vector is contravariant or covariant depends on how its components transform relative to the basis vectors. So if the component increases when the basis vector is transformed to a bigger basis vector, that is a covariant component. If the component shrinks when the basis vector gets larger, that is a contravariant component. It varies contrary to the basis vector. Now, why are basis vectors covariant? Let me give a quick and dirty numerical example. Say I have a basis vector E1 given by the components 1, 0, 0 in three dimensions. Say that I now double the length of E1 to get a new basis vector E1 prime. When I do that, then in terms of the old components of E1, the components of E1 prime also double. In other words, the component of the basis vector co-varies with the basis vector. It is covariant. Again, when the basis vector doubles, its components double. Since the components co-vary with the basis vector, the basis vector, by definition, is covariant. That was a long explanation for something that might be obvious to many of you, but for those of you who were initially unclear, hopefully that made some sense. So anyway, going back, I've written the metric tensor here as the dot product of two basis vectors. And let's use this formulation, this definition, to actually compute the metric tensor in Cartesian coordinates. I'll denote this using a line in front of the g sub ij and writing cart for Cartesian. Now my basis vectors in Cartesian coordinates, you'll recall, are just the unit vectors i hat, j hat, and k hat in the x, y, and z directions respectively that you're all familiar with. So that means the nine components of my metric tensor in Cartesian coordinates would be given by the following in terms of the basis E1, E2, and E3. And if we replace the E1, E2, and E3 with I hat, J hat, and K hat respectively, this is what we'll get. Now, I hat, J hat, and K hat form an orthonormal basis, which means that all of these vectors are perpendicular. They're all orthogonal to each other, and they all have a magnitude of 1. So therefore, the dot product of one of these basis vectors with itself is 1. However, the dot product of these vectors with each other is 0 because they're orthogonal. So if we perform these substitutions, we'll find that in the end, the metric tensor in Cartesian coordinates according to the dot product formula is the identity tensor, just as we showed in the previous video, so things are consistent. I'll now invite the viewer to use this dot product formula to show that the metric tensors in cylindrical and spherical coordinates are given by these expressions, where I've specified the meaning of x super 1, x super 2, and x super 3 for each of these coordinate systems. You can arrive at these expressions by expressing the basis vectors in each coordinate system in terms of i hat, j hat, and k hat, and then taking their dot products from there. But I've left that as an exercise since it's just algebra and won't really add to your understanding of the metric tensor beyond what I've done so far. Bear in mind that all of these expressions for the metric tensor in different coordinate systems ultimately describe the same tensor because we're still in Euclidean space, the standard space that we're all used to. It's just that when we transform the coordinate system, the components of the metric tensor and the basis vectors corresponding to those components transform. However, the metric tensor itself does not change in the same Euclidean space. It's a tensor after all, so it should not change just with a change of coordinates.
But if I looked at the metric tensor in a non-Euclidean space, so say I were at the surface of a sphere and I wanted to calculate distances along that sphere using the metric tensor, or if I were studying special relativity and now suddenly found myself in Minkowski space, in these different non-Euclidean spaces, my metric tensor would be fundamentally different from these Euclidean metric tensor in Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. It's just that if I'm confined to Euclidean space, then different coordinate systems in Euclidean space will not fundamentally change my metric tensor, but being in a different space will. So hopefully that makes sense, but if this distinction between space and coordinate system is unclear, feel free to let me know in the comments. Anyway, in the next part of the video, I'm going to describe some important properties of the metric tensor. These properties are what make the metric tensor a metric tensor. They quote-unquote define the metric tensor. So let's go over them. Say I have a matrix field G over some coordinate system where the coordinates are given by x super i. The components of this matrix field are given by G sub ij. Now what I mean by matrix field is that for every point in a specified region of space, the matrix field gives you a matrix. It's kind of like a vector field. In a vector field, every point in the specified region of space gives you a vector, but with a matrix field, you get a matrix instead. So now I've defined G as a matrix, but a matrix is not a tensor. I've said that before and I'll say it again, and it's especially not a metric tensor. So in order for G to be a metric tensor, it has to satisfy these other properties. The first property is that the components of G must be differentiable to at least the second order. They must be twice differentiable. The second property is that G is symmetric. That is to say the components with inverted indices are all equal to each other. So G sub ij equals G sub ji. In algebra terms, the matrix representing G is equal to its transpose, which is what the symmetric property is saying. And this makes sense because the metric tensor component G sub ij is the dot product of EI and EJ, so that means G sub JI is the dot product of EJ and EI, but the dot product is commutative, so that means it makes sense that G sub ij and G sub JI are equal. Now the third property is that G is a bilinear form. To explain this, let's take two random vectors whose components are given by V super i and W super j. Let's create this expression now where I put the components of G in front of my vectors V super i and W super j's components. If G is a bilinear form, then scaling either of these individual vector components by some factor a is the same as scaling the whole expression by that factor a. In addition, adding a third vector such as u super j to the w super j or t super i to the v super i is the same as distributing that vector out in the way that I've shown in these equations. So if G satisfies these properties, that is one of the properties it needs to satisfy to be a metric tensor. Now the fourth property is that if I take the product of the components of G, or Gij, with the vector v super i and the same vector v but now with a different index v super j, then this product cannot be zero unless the vector v is zero. Some books will actually say that this product can only be positive, but that rule generally only applies to Riemannian metric tensors. I'm going to be more general and allow non-Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian metrics, which will actually come up with the Minkowski metric in special relativity. Now you can actually verify that all four of these properties, 1, 2, 3, and 4, are true for our Cartesian metric tensor, which I'll copy-paste again over here. Its components are all differentiable. It's symmetric, meaning the matrix representing this metric is equal to its transpose, and it's also bilinear if you check bilinearity. In fact, you can show that for the fourth property, the final answer is just the sum over i of the squared components of v, which is obviously always positive unless v is zero. So the Cartesian metric satisfies all the necessary properties required for a metric tensor. Now that we've discussed ways to determine the metric tensor and the properties of the metric tensor, let's discuss a really important application of the metric tensor, which is to raise and lower indices. In other words, I can use the metric tensor to convert contravariant vector components to covariant vector components, and I can use another version of the metric tensor to convert covariant components to contravariant components. Let's look at an example of this. Say I have a vector given by the contravariant components v super i. To convert these contravariant components to covariant components v sub j, 
I can multiply v super i and sum with the components of the metric tensor g sub ij. This should make some sense, because on the right hand side the i is the dummy index since it's repeated twice, so by the rules of Einstein notation, dummy indices are summed over, so when you sum over that index i, which I'm doing right here in this expanded out expression, it should go away and ultimately leave you with the free index j at the end. And since the free index j is at the bottom, it's a subscript, what you're left with is a vector component which is specified with a subscript index, so v sub j. So this is how you can use the metric tensor to lower the index. And this doesn't just apply to vectors. The metric tensor can also lower the indices of other higher rank tensors. So for instance, if I had a rank 3 tensor capital T, which had a contravariant rank of 2 and a covariant rank of 1 originally, then I could once again use the covariant metric tensor to lower one of the indices of T. In this case, I'll use G sub ij to lower the index J on the T. So what I'll end up with is another tensor with a contravariant rank of 1 this time, and a covariant rank of 2 since I have now lowered one of the indices. I can also use the metric tensor to raise indices. However, it's not the metric tensor itself that'll get used, it's a tensor that's based on the metric tensor. It's the inverse metric tensor, also called the conjugate metric tensor. The inverse metric tensor has a contravariant rank of 2, so now both of the indices are written as superscripts. Again, to show how this inverse metric tensor will raise indices, I'll revisit the example of the vector, this time a vector given by covariant components v sub i. To convert these covariant components to contravariant components v super j, I can multiply v sub i and sum with the components of the inverse metric tensor g super ij. Again, it should make sense why this works. The i is the dummy index here, so it gets summed over. And when you sum over the i, you're left with the free index j, but this time in the superscript, which you can ultimately write as the contravariant component v super j. This rule also applies to higher rank tensors, so you can take something again like a tensor t, represented by these components with one contravariant index and two covariant indices, you can take these tensor components, apply the inverse metric tensor, and raise one of the lower indices to end up with a new tensor with contravariant rank 2 and covariant rank 1 this time. Now there's two things I need to mention before ending the video. The first is that when I raise or lower the index, the value of the component also changes, so it doesn't necessarily stay the same. For instance, I can't say in this index lowering equation that the values of v super i and v sub j are the same. That's wrong because the metric tensor is modifying v super i and summing over the index i. It's not just lowering the index and leaving everything else intact. The only time the values are the same when you change the position of the index when you raise or lower it is if the metric tensor is the identity tensor, which is what you get when there's an orthonormal basis. But this isn't always true. The second thing I'll mention is that you might wonder why I need the metric tensor to lower indices and its inverse to raise indices. Why not just use any tensor with a covariant rank of 2? After all, it'll technically do the same thing. There's nothing special about g that I've used here in showing you how it lowers the index. Well, to explain why I can only use the metric tensor to raise and lower indices, it comes down to the special properties, the fact that it's symmetric and represents a bilinear form. But to delve further into this, I need to talk about dual vectors and how metric tensors connect regular vectors to dual vectors. But that should do it for this video. The next lesson is going to be on taking the derivative of a tensor. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.